Hello and welcome to Unit 6, the European Transformation and Adaptation of Chocolate. The learning outcomes for this unit are Number one, compare the documentary sources for chocolate in early modern Europe. Number two, understand the Galenic humor system and how chocolate was incorporated into it. Number three, describe the initial applications of the chocolate drink in European society. And number four, recognize the importance of royal courts and the nobility for the spread of chocolate. Chocolate began to be imported into Europe during the 17th century. Europe at this time was a culture on the threshold of modernity. It boasted of many large cities such as Venice, which is what you see here. New trade routes began to flood European markets with all sorts of exotic products. Europe was also a very divided place. The Protestant Reformation had shattered the religious unity of Europe and had ushered in a century of warfare. Kings in France and elsewhere became more powerful than ever before. The Renaissance had created a rebirth in scholarly activity and literacy. This knowledge, however, was rooted in the past. The scientific revolution and the Enlightenment and the changes in modern worldview that they would bring were still yet to come in the future. As we move in the course from Mesoamerica to Europe, we are confronted with new types of primary sources for historians to use. All of these primary sources help illuminate how Europeans became acclimatized and eventually changed the chocolate drink. When Europeans first began to use chocolate, it was most commonly thought of as a medicine. Consequently, one of the first European sources to discuss chocolate are medical books. However, during the 17th century, Europeans were increasingly literate, especially the upper classes. Another important source for chocolate are the personal letters which people discuss their impressions of the chocolate drink. We can add to that all sorts of written documents, including recipes with used chocolate, or financial records or reports documenting the sale or import of chocolate. Art can also be a useful source for the history of chocolate. This is particularly true since, due to the expense of the exotic Mesoamerican drink of chocolate, only the upper class drank it, who are also more likely to have their lives depicted in art. Finally, we also have surviving physical objects from the period, such as the French chocolate pot, called the chocolatère. Now, it's already been said that when chocolate first arrived in Europe, many people first encountered it as a medicine. Thus, to understand the early European adoption of chocolate, one must understand how Europeans conceptualized medicine. Medieval and early modern medical knowledge was based on the concept of auctoritas, or authority is the translation from Latin. These were the ancient texts or authors which were considered infallible. This means that one was not supposed to question an authority. These texts were always right. Our understanding of them is the only limiting factor. The greatest authorities were the Greek and Roman philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle. With respect to medicine, one philosopher in particular, Galen, who lived in the uh, mid-2nd century, was considered the greatest authority on medicine. You see a bust of, of uh, him there on the right. Now Galen was especially influential, but what was most influential was his ideas of the humor system, or the humoral system. Galen believed that the human body was divided into four humors. Humoral derives from the word humor, which in this context means fluid. The human body was thought to contain a mix of four humors. Black bile, known as melancholy, yellow or red bile, blood and phlegm. Each individual had a particular humoral makeup or constitution. 
and health was defined as the proper humoral balance for that individual. An imbalance of the humors resulted in disease. Galen's humoral theory was one of the central principles in Western medicine from antiquity through the 18th century. It is in this context that bloodletting was a common medical treatment during the Middle Ages and early modern period. Bloodletting was considered one of the ways to get the humors back into balance. It was, in fact, a common practice until the 18th century. For example, uh, Christian monks and nuns enjoyed recreational bleeding once a month. It was considered a good way to stay healthy. It is in this context in which chocolate was incorporated into European medicine and Galenic theories. It became a medicine which could help restore balance in the humors, just like bloodletting, but perhaps a little bit more enjoyable. Chocolate properties were usually associated with cold and dry, so in that sense it could be used to offset a condition which was believed to be caused by an excess of heat or moisture. Other exotic new medicines, such as coffee from the Islamic world and tobacco from the New World, were used too. In the late 16th and early 17th century, around the same time that Europe was being introduced to chocolate, it was also being introduced to coffee and tea as well. Indeed, the drinks all have a very similar early history all three being initially marketed for their medicinal properties, and all three being considered exotic and foreign. Coffee was made from the beans of the coffee plant and originated in Africa, specifically Ethiopia. It then spread to the Middle East and eventually into Europe in the 15th or 16th century. Tea was native to Asia, and in particular China, where it had been grown for thousands of years. Thus, both coffee and tea are old world products, whereas chocolate is a new world product. However, the first European writings for all three products all appear around the same time. And by the 17th century, all three products, tea, coffee, and chocolate, were being imported into vast quantities into Europe. Very quickly, these beverages begin to be used outside of medicinal purposes and become fashionable recreational beverages as well. Chocolate begins to be associated recreationally at the Spanish court during the 17th century. Chocolate, more so than coffee or tea, begins to become associated with the rich, upper-class nobility of the courts of Europe. Over time, it spread to other countries as an exotic and expensive novelty. Again, it spread as almost entirely amongst the wealthiest and most powerful people in Europe. In doing so, it joins other exotic beverages and products, coffee, tea, and tobacco. It is also during this time that chocolate begins to be flavored with sugar. However, this happens at the same time that other products are becoming infused with sweetness as well. For instance, coffee and tea become sugared drinks at the exact same time. In France, chocolate became associated with the court of the most powerful king in Europe, Louis XIV, otherwise known as the Sun King. Louis XIV was an absolutist king which means that he held near absolute power. He is often associated with his Palace of Versailles, one of the largest and most extravagant palaces in the world. During the 17th century, chocolate became a favored drink served at royal banquets and other official affairs. The French had refined the dining experience to the point of extravagance. It was in that spirit that they crafted the chocolatier a vessel uniquely suited for the preparing of chocolate. This rising demand for sugar, chocolate, and other exotic products fueled a system of colonization, exploitation, and the slave trade. In our next unit, we'll explore the role of chocolate in European colonization.